she likes you a lot. Welcome everyone uh, to the last uh, IPC lunch before the spring break. Uh, so next week we are taking a break to celebrate the spring, which uh, may have not been apparent to some of you, but I mean the sun is hiding behind the clouds. Uh, sure. it, yes, for at least uh, another billion years it will stay the same. Um, and um, uh, we just heard an excellent uh, IPC Colloquium by Dan uh, Skolnik uh, from Duke, who is warning us that systematics may be creeping into uh, cosmological data sets, and uh, perhaps we can somehow remove them. But uh, we will hear more from Dan um, uh, later on in a few minutes. Uh, our first speaker is local uh, here at Harvard, uh, Maurice uh, Wilson. Uh, who is being uh, advised by Jason Eastman, and uh, he will talk about the, I guess the title changed from what I had, uh, the miniature oh. exoplanet radial velocity arrays, That's first perfect. radial velocities. And then uh, we'll hear from uh, Jedida Eiler, uh, who is visiting us from Southwood. Uh, where is Jedida? Oh, nice to see you. Um, and she will uh, talk about on the vanguard, uh, building an intersectional STEM framework. We very much look forward to hearing that, uh, and also later this afternoon uh, at the CFA colloquium. Um, and uh, then we'll hear from Dan uh, about addressing possible issues with local distance ladder measurements of the Hubble constant. A very timely subject uh, because of the tension that is uh, associated with the Hubble constant. And finally, we'll hear from uh, uh, our colleague down down the street, uh, Paul Chesler from the Black Hole Initiative, uh, who decided to educate us about uh, uh, some uh, important uh, phenomena in physics, uh, and he will talk about holographic um, signatures of critical gravitational collapse. Uh, we'll start with Maurice. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Today I'll be discussing the first radio velocity measurements for the miniature exoplanet radio velocity array. Uh, that's a, man, this podium is so close. That's a long name, so we call it Minerva for short. Um, before I get into the radio velocities though, I'll first describe what Minerva is. Minerva is a robotic array of four telescopes. They're located on Mount Hopkins in Arizona. and. Uh, in this beautiful image, you can see uh, the four telescopes separated in twos. Uh, this fifth telescope is just, um, it's known as Minerva Red, and it's a sister project to the original four telescope mission. The primary mission of Minerva is to use Doppler spectroscopy to get radio velocities on super Earths. And these super Earths uh, would uh, be in the habitable zones around bright stars. To help us study those super Earths, uh, we have a goal of achieving a precision of less than one meter per second. The secondary mission of Minerva is to get transit photometry on the super Earths that may be in our radio velocity target list. What helps us out in that endeavor is that we have a precision of less than one milli magnitude for our uh, photometry. The most powerful thing about Minerva though is our spectacular cadence. Um, no other observatory is getting as much spectra as we're getting within a single night, every single night. Uh, what, what's, what's allowing us to do this is, um, let me give an example. Um, on a good night, uh, weather permitting, we're getting 60 to 80 spectra uh, for the uh, stars on our radio velocity target list. What's allowing us to do this is basically that we don't have to propose and fight over telescope time. So Minerva, we've made sure that Min the Minerva Observatory is dedicated to performing a radio velocity survey of bright stars that hopefully have plenty of super Earths uh, orbiting those stars. So now that you understand the purpose of Minerva, the Minerva mission, I'll now describe my journey in uh, getting this mission up and running. About two and a half years ago, uh, I became a graduate student here and I started on the photometry side of Minerva. 
Then after that, I started uh, working on the software that controls the telescopes autonomously. Then after that software work, I started working on spectroscopy side of Minerva. Um, from a spectroscopy point of view, you can think of Minerva as three different components. You have the telescope and its fiber acquisition unit. Then you have the spectrograph itself. And then you have the optical fibers that connect the telescope to the spectrograph. Those three components are really important because they affect the overall stability of the spectrograph. So because that's true, uh, I decided to do instrumentation work on uh, Minerva as well. Uh, I did a lot of uh, work determining whether or not we truly do have a stable spectrograph. Uh, and eventually, I found that we really do have a stable spectrograph. And that's, that's helping us out tremendously in our uh, goal of achieving high precision radio velocities. After I did that instrumentation work, I decided to tackle the radio velocity pipeline for Minerva. To put it simply, uh, this complicated pipeline converts Doppler spectroscopy to radio velocities. It's a complicated pipeline, but that's a simple way of describing it. Uh, so after I put the finishing touches on the pipeline, I was then able to finally get my radio velocities. And here are some of the, uh, are some of the radio velocities. We've been taking, like I said, plenty of spectra. So this is one example in many. <clears throat> I, we observed the RV standard star. Um, as far as we know, there is no exoplanet orbiting this star, and it's not very magnetically active. So, in other words, the radio velocity should be flat. And based on this data set, uh, that lasts for about a month and a half, um, there definitely doesn't seem to be any periodic signal in this data. So that's great from an RV pipeline point of view, because that tells me that my code isn't introducing any false signals into the data. So that's good news. Um, but I determined my precision based on this Allen variance plot. The, uh, basically, essentially what I'm doing here is just taking the RMS of the data set uh, at a given binning. Uh, so the idea is that my precision is supposed to remain parallel to this yellow line. And the reason why is because this yellow line represents uh, uh, white, uh, what my RMS would be if our data set only contained white noise. That's the only noise we would uh, pre, uh, are fine with in our data. So if the precision diverges from the yellow line, that basically means I'm hitting a systematic noise floor. And so as you can see, the precision doesn't get really any better. So I stop the, I stop the binning uh, before it diverges, and that's at a binning of 6. And at a binning of 6, we get a radio velocity precision of 1.8 meters per second. Now, this is uh, great news. Uh, it's been two plus years, uh, so I'm happy to see this result. Um, and this is, this is basically one result uh, for this data set, for this star. Uh, I do have plans on uh, doing the same test on other RV standard stars. But what I can say definitely right now is that um, finally, uh, Minerva is producing precise radio velocities. The next test is to see if Minerva is producing accurate radio velocities. <laughs> and, wow, what are you laughing for? <laughs> uh, this, this is it's going to end well. Uh, uh, the um, way to test this out is to just characterize an exoplanet and to see if my results are similar to everyone else's. So I did this test on 51 peg. The uh, 51 peg V is a hot Jupiter. So from a radio velocity point of view, it should be really easy to detect, and it should be easy to characterize this exoplanet. We have uh, Minerva data, um, radio velocities. Here's just a normal time series on the left. On the right is a, the same radio velocity data, but just phase folded to the orbital period of the planet. Uh, the red line is the orbital solution of the exoplanet's orbit. And I, I use exofast. To, get, to characterize this exoplanet, which thus gives me the orbital solution of the planet. After using exofast, uh, it spits out all of this information about the entire system, which is very helpful. But for the purposes of this test, the parameters I care about the most are the radial velocity parameters. So here's the orbital period of the planet, the eccentricity, the RV semi-amplitude, and the minimum mass of the planet. The, what I'm doing here is basically just comparing my results to the most trusted, uh, already quoted results in the literature. And that's in this column. My uh, results are in this column. 
So I'm trying to see if I'm within one sigma of the uh, trusted radial velocity reference uh, values. And as you can see, I am uh, with all of these radial velocity parameters. Uh, so that tells me that because I've proven that I can accurately characterize an exoplanet with Minerva data, that must mean that Minerva is producing accurate radial velocities. <coughs> to summarize, our radial velocity operations are operating at an uh, incredible cadence, unprecedented. We also have a stable spectrograph, which is helping us out tremendously with high precision radio velocities that we apparently have. I also finished uh, our radio velocity pipeline, and because I did that work, I can say that uh, as of now we have a precision of 1.8 meters per second. Lastly, I can also say that uh, we have uh, Minerva is producing precise and accurate radio velocities, and I was able to confirm that by accurately characterizing an exoplanet. For future work, uh, we hope to use our high cadence to really uh, better understand the stellar jitter issue, which is a serious issue in the exoplanet community. So we hope to put our cadence to good use for the community. Um, we also hope to just continue increasing uh, the baseline for long period planets to really cover that long period. And lastly, because 1.8 is not 1.0, we have ideas on how to improve our precision um, that include uh, looking at our stellar templates more closely, um, really determining if our barycentric correction is as accurate as we think it is, uh, checking what our far field scrambling, how well that's doing. We have, good, uh, we have a good idea that our near field scrambling is great, but we haven't really uh, investigated thoroughly our far field. And there's a possibility of moonlight contamination as well. So these are just some of the many ideas we have as to how we may be able to improve our radial velocity precision. With that, I'll stop and take any questions. Yeah, um, I'm hoping to do that. <laughs> uh, this is, so uh, the goal is to make sure that we can discover any plant first. Uh, and I've definitely proven that here. So I'm, I'm happy about this, but hopefully the next paper I write will be on a brand new uh, super earth of some sort. So, so how, how are you choosing your, your targets um, right now? And how many targets are you observing? Uh, our RV target list is, uh, consists of about 80 stars, and that, is a, that 80 stars is a subset of about 150 stars from a um, Ada Earth survey uh, that was conducted. Um, and that survey basically um, chose its targets uh, because its targets are uh, essentially uh, chromospherically inactive. So we don't want to deal with stellar activity. We, uh, that's a hard problem to solve. So to simplify things, pick a star that has the least amount of uh, magnetic activity. Uh, so from that uh, list of uh, stars, we get our subset, which are very bright stars. That's why ours is a subset. Um, and, uh, well, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's it. Let's um, Just quickly, what's your magnitude limit that you, that you think you yeah. go to with that precision? Oh, with this precision particularly, um, I haven't investigated that. I know in general, um, in general with the Minerva array, because we have an effective aperture of 1.4 meters, uh, our magnitude limit is uh, V of 8. Uh, so uh, V of 8 and less, so we brighter stars than 8. Um, so. so aside from the stellar jitter, what, what is the goal for the project? Or what, what is it doing mm -hmm. better than Kepler or different? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Kepler uh, did great at observing uh, dim stars in, in, uh, deep, in deep field, um, and one patch of the sky particularly. Uh, Minerva is a radial velocity follow-up uh, survey, essentially. Uh, but also, what makes us different is our incredible cadence. So I'm hoping that we really can make our mark on the stellar jitter point of view. But in the meanwhile, before I can prove that, um, I'm hoping to just be, increase the baseline of long period planets. So with Kepler and a lot of other, even tests, uh, they're only observing, um, well, Kepler did observe for a long period of time, but tests, for example, uh, only about 30 days per patch of sky. 
So that's the great thing about ground-based observatories. And, and Minerva in particular can do RV and photometry. So we can do both at any time we want. And it really takes a dedicated observatory to do this, uh, to get the cover the entire orbit. If you're not dedicated, you're probably only going to do it per season, and that can bias your results. Uh, so the fact that we can do it year long and do it well is superb. Question. Go ahead. Um, so great talk, thank you. Um, so two questions very quickly. What is the spectral range or the coverage mm -hmm. of your um, mm -hmm. observations? And second, how are you calibrating your the wavelengths? So I mean, I see oh, yeah, the, yeah. the mm -hmm. improvement, mm -hmm. improvement in your RV position, and you don't mention like any. Oh, standards. wavelength solution. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, <laughs> I mentioned uh, this is uh, several of uh, many possibilities, but these are the main ones that we can. So to answer your question, uh, we have a Kiwi Spet spectrograph. Mm -hmm. It ranges from uh, 500 nanometers to 630 nanometers, and that's uh, geared around the iodine uh, lines because we we use a iodine absorption cell to um, uh, calibrate our wavelength to find our wavelength solution. Um, does that answer all yeah, the questions? Uh, yeah, so uh, in, in other words, um, we think we have a great wavelength solution. Uh, so I didn't put that on this list of the main things in care. Yeah. Last question, Erwin. I was just wondering, you mentioned your high cadence was unprecedented. I was wondering how, how much higher it is than your next nearest competitor and to what you attribute the ability to do this highest cadence. Well, the main thing, the, uh, one, well, two things, uh, now that I have a little more time to talk. Um, I mentioned that uh, we're a dedicated observatory. We don't have to fight over telescope time. That's the main thing. The second thing is that we have four telescopes. And um, we, we, with four optical fibers uh, leading to the spectrograph, uh, that gives us four traces. And we do not, there isn't any crosstalk. Uh, so uh, what someone would, for a telescope, that is getting the same time as us, they're only getting one uh, trace while we're getting four at the same time period. So that's great from, uh, for several points of view, even though a larger aperture could be better in some cases. So that's, one, so that's two examples. Uh, we have four different telescopes that helps us out with our cadence, as well as the fact that uh, we're dedicated. Um, what was your second question? Oh yeah, highest cadence in comparison. Um, I don't know who our nearest competitors are because I don't I don't know of any other I don't know of any observatory that's as dedicated as we are. And furthermore, no one's like walking around bragging about high cadence except us. <laughs> <like that. laughs> so, I don't. That's why I haven't I haven't really read any papers that anyone bragging about high cadence. Since I know that you are not arrogant, <laughs> <laughs> it's very good news. So yeah, good luck with, with your future observations. Let's thank the Boris. shares a very near and dear place in my heart. Um, all right, so in my former life, well, right now, I am a brand new faculty member at Dartmouth College. I studied Blazar, so you'll hear much more about that this afternoon. Uh, but in my former life, I was an NS NSF postdoc, and one of the hallmarks of being an NSF postdoc is that you have some non-trivial, broader impact that you work on. Um, and I teed that up to say that this is what I worked on, but in point of fact, I did this just for fun and then asked if I could retro add it to my NSF proposal. Um, but it is the work that I do um, to help sustain me and find a way to make space in 
uh, STEM. So, on the Vanguard, full title, Conversations with Women of Color in STEM. It is an online platform and community that centers and experiences, centers and highlights the experiences of women of color in STEM. What is that handy dandy pointer you had? Oh, I guess. You still have it. <laughs> well, it's mine. <laughs> <laughs> that would make sense. Oh, I can't. I don't have a USB. Don't worry. Don't worry. It's all good. You can have it back. I apologize. I'm going to take you Yeah, so it's an online platform and community that centers the experiences of women of color in STEM. Uh, and we do that, I should say, women of color and non-binary folks of color in STEM. We do that because these folks with these particular set of identities are often left outside of the conversation about what the culture needs and what folks need to survive and thrive in STEM fields. So we're looking at this particular intersection because conversations about gender often center on white women, conversations about people of color often center on men. So you find that if you sit in an intersection, you kind of don't get in the conversation. So we wanted to create a space that specifically does that. Um, and how do we do that? We basically are creating a community. Uh, and that community is being designed intentionally such that folks can self-advocate. That is to say, it's not my job. I, can't, I cannot represent the voice of every single woman of color or non-binary person of color in STEM. But I can encourage a space that fosters conversation so that that person can advocate for themselves. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to provide skills and tools for this community to make sure that they thrive in these STEM spaces. Um, and in a particular interest, we're really um, after them pursuing uniquely their STEM identity and their personal identity at the same time. So you should never have to give up any part of your person to actually pursue these really interesting STEM questions that we are trying to do right now. And I guess I should pull that in and say astronomy questions given where I am. Uh, so that's what we're trying to do. How do we do that? We use an empirical literature-based set of best practices that focus on increasing belonging. That is to center a space that allows you to walk in and feel like you're just as welcome there as anyone else. There is literature on that. We know how to make people feel like they belong. So we do that. How do you do that? One, alignment. You show someone that they can be what they imagine themselves to be. Two, you help them imagine themselves in that role. Three, you show them the path to create a shared history between what you do and what they do. Turns out if you do those three things, folks will feel like they belong. So we just create opportunities to make sure that those three things happen on a regular basis. This all started actually really simply when um, I was at Syracuse and a bunch of undergrads were like, hey, you're the only black faculty member here. Turns out I was a postdoc, so in point of fact, I wasn't. There were none. Um, but they could see themselves in me, and they could see me farther along the trajectory. And they didn't know how to do it, so they asked me about it. And I said, well, yeah, I am, but just quiet as this kept, I'm also trying to figure this thing out. So I'm going to call my friends. We're going to hop on a Google call, and we're going to figure out how to do this work. And so it grew from that to what it is now. I'm going to tell you what it is now in just a second. But ultimately, we really just put folks up that are doing the work, that are fully qualified, that are around in the space to give their advice and suggestions about how to be successful. And not just how to be successful like moving through the space, but also how to be successful technically. There's some real hardcore technical aspects, and so we want to make sure that they're getting the opportunity to share their voice and their insight while being themselves. So that's super straightforward, exactly what we do. Um, not difficult at all. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about um, how we form this uh, STEM identity, um, which is also a thing in the literature. In fact, there's a paper by Carlon and Johnson in 2007 that talks about uh, STEM identity in women of color in particular. So this really is, this is an active area of research. Uh, but they talk about one of the key ways, apart from the three that I told you, to show people that they belong is to recognize them. <coughs> we know that. We like it when people call us by our names. And when they smile and come to the room, like recognition is very important. That's why we give awards. That's why we have these really awesome talks where one person stands and the rest of the people sit and we all listen. That like this is important, right? So this is not a new concept. Uh, but it also is acknowledging that there are meaningful others, folks whose opinion you care about. They are meaningful others. And that definition matters because if you have a meaningful other and they don't think that you're very meaningful, you will not feel like you belong. Anybody? No, I'm not going to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> We're just not going to talk about that. Uh, the second thing we do is we redefine what it means to do science. 
how you do science, why you do science, the questions that you ask. We just redefine it. Why? Because we're constantly inventing things. That's what we do. So we're just saying you should be able to create a space where you're asking questions as yourself with folks who you view as meaningful and who view as you, you as meaningful that will train everybody how to do that. The other thing is what it means to be a girl or a woman of color, color or a non-binary person of color in STEM. <coughs> the reason why I'm saying that is because science is not done in a vacuum. And so people bring with them all kinds of predilections, let's call it an impolite company, uh, that impact the way other folks work. So if your predilection coming into a space is that women of color don't belong here, then I don't want to walk in that realization. That is not how I want to be recognized. So we have to redefine those things after them. So we do a lot of that. How do we do that? Easy peasy. It's called cultural production. And what it is, is it says that I understand what the larger cultural context is that I am often placed in. I'm just going to pretend like that's not there. And not pretend like it's not there as if it's like trivial or not important, but just to say that that is not going to be what I'm going to use to define myself. <clears throat> right? So you, re you reproduce, literally reprogram how the definition of what a woman of color is or a non-binary person of color is in your brain to be something else that is often in, uh, what's the word, what's the word, uh, contrast, in contrast to what dominant culture says. So that's cultural production, people do this all the time. So we are countering the meanings of what people generally assume women of color, girls, and non-binary folks of color do instead. All right, and if you do that, if you can acknowledge that it's possible to live at the intersection of identities, to love STEM or science or astronomy, let's go with that, and to be able to do it with the acumen of anyone else, that you can redefine your structure of who is meaningful so that you don't have to remove folks that, are, that matter to you from your matrix of, um, matrix of support, then you feel like you belong, you're more likely to persist. We call this the development of an intersectional STEM identity. And our idea is that if we can get folks to think of themselves as STEM people by this more expanded definition, then we'd just be happier. <laughs> and there is a side, someone could say, oh, well, the other benefit would be that the field would be better. That's also true, but we're actually after the freedom perspective, that is to say that folks who are interested in science should pursue it because they want to, and even if they never had any benefit to someone else, they've gotten to pursue that thing that gets them up in the morning and ask questions. So that's a secondary, um, not trivial, but secondary goal. Okay, so started with this uh, Google Hangout. <laughs> I called my friends, I legit did, I'm not even. This was when Google Hangout first came out. Do you remember this? Uh, Joel and I was great. Anyway, uh, and I just called my friends to ask questions. It took off like wildfire. And every time we tried something new, we were like, can you share it with us? We were like, sure. That's no problem. It's not like I'm trying to get a job. It's fine. Let's just do the thing. Um, and it's grown into its own thing. And so now our newest intervention is called conference crashing. What we do is we show up. It is what it sounds. Just so you know. It's not any deeper than that. Uh, we show up at conferences, uh, professional STEM conferences. We buy a booth, so technically it's not fully crashing because we don't actually want to get pulled out. Um, but we do set a booth. We have a space where folks can get what we call guerrilla mentoring. That is to say, in situ mentoring about whatever you need at the time from women of color and non-binary folks of color in STEM. So this is our first run at it. This is the Emerging Researchers Network in uh, DC. And it's amazing. We did it. We have done it now at three conferences. Uh, AAAS, ERN, SACNIS, there's another one I can't remember. Uh, anyway, if you want to get involved, you should talk to us. We have lots of ways you can get involved. Most of them surround the fact that you have broader impacts and we have good ideas. I would be remiss if I did not tell you who helped me do this. I did not do it all myself. Our team has expanded dramatically. Uh, these are all um, black women in particular and they all have STEM degrees or are in pursuit of more. So they are doing double duty uh, for things that they're passionate about. And in an irony, I'm going to ask you my science question from the last slide. Uh, I want to learn machine learning. It's something that I'm really interested in. I have no idea how to do it. So if you want to be my bestie, please <laughs> talk to me. We'll throw it out. Thank you. Uh, actually, we have a suggestion for you.
your last question. Yes. Yeah. She sits right here, and her name is Michelle. I know, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> One thing, uh, well, first of all, to Dyla, I should say that what you're doing is extremely important. Keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. But um, when I looked around the room, yeah. you mentioned the term. Yeah. I saw all people above the age of 60 yeah. raised, you know, couldn't really figure out what this term means. Yes. And those under, I, I think, know what it means. Non-binary, can you explain that? Yes, non-binary. So we generally, in this culture, and by culture I mean the entire world, um, view, <laughs> view gender as being binary, that you are either male or you're female. Um, and that that's your category, and most people actually incorrectly assume that it's uh, stat, cis. Um, but non-binary suggests that folks exist on a spectrum of gender identity that is also fluid. And so when I say non-binary, I just mean humans in bodies. <laughs> um, and I want them to feel safe. And in fact, when Vanguard STEM started, we explicitly said women of color in STEM because that was the community that I was dealing with. But as we talk to folks, we realize that women of color sit at this intersection that is actually very similar to what non-binary <coughs> folks sit in. Um, and there aren't the exact same issues, but there are so many areas of crosstalk that it would be good at least to say out loud that folks with non-binary identities exist in the world. And we just want to make sure that we're constantly just like throwing it out there for conversation. So we should call them continue rather than <laughs> I don't let them find themselves, but um, sounds good. Sounds good. Okay, Daniel. I'm just curious as to what fraction of, of participants in your efforts are kind of at the um, PhD and above level yeah. versus the undergrad level versus yeah. the high school level. I'm curious as to where you're trying to aim. Your this is a good question. So, in point of fact, I was aiming for college students and graduate students. Um, and what happened was, every time we did something that was even semi-public, a new demographic showed up. So I do some engagement work in public speaking in other <coughs> uh, And a little girl who was eight, had her, is, and is homeschooled, had her mother email me. Um, and she wants to be an astronomy professor in particular. Uh, and so we jumped on a call, and she showed me this, um, this effectively a log scale drawing that she did where the size of the star was its brightness. And like, I was like, I am undercheating. But that was my point. My point is to say that like, th these issues resonate with folks at a much broader set of ages than we thought. So we're using different language for, say, cyberbullying in college students. But uh, middle school girls feel that same thing. They just don't have the language. So we actually have folks from literally eight years old up to deans of college in our program because everybody feels like they see themselves in that space. Other questions or comments? Thank you. So oh, one last question. Yes, Peter. So you have one about uh, using social media. Yeah. I'm just curious, like, is there a particular platform or, or kind of style engagement that you found works the best or has the most traction? Yes, there is something super snarky I can say about that, that Facebook, Instagram, and what that went down yesterday. Um, but I will not say that. Um, we actually use it, uh, Twitter most. And we use Twitter most because it seems to facilitate conversation better. Um, you can just have like a longer stream of conversation. Now they've changed their algorithm over time, which makes it a little harder. Um, but we focus on Twitter, uh, although we have accounts everywhere. Um, and recently we've been putting a lot of our like original content on Medium because it's another way to like inspire vir virality. But um, mostly it's Twitter and we'll see. How on Twitter it's this uh, address there. Right? Yeah, that's us on Twitter. Okay. Well, let's thank uh, the director. <laughs>
this picture of the universe as a baby. Uh, we have these measurements for the cosmic microwave background. And then we have this picture of the universe today as an adult. This is this local distance uh, ladder uh, measurement of the Hubble constant. And then kind of like a doctor's growth curve, uh, we could say, all right, let's trace kind of where the universe is as a baby all the way to today. And we could say, how, you know, how, how good is the curve? And the curve in this sense is the standard model of cosmology. And right now, basically, what we're seeing is, the diff is it as if the doctor said you're going to be about five foot seven and you end up about six foot one. And these are, those match to 67 and 73 or so, in case. Uh, very human scales. Okay, so there's, there's a few possibilities, obviously, of what could be happening. One is that our measurement of the universe as a baby could be off. One is that our me measurement today could be off. Or the really exciting one is maybe there's something going on with our standard model of cosmology. All right. Now, to quickly go over how we measure the Hubble constant, it's three steps for the distance ladder. The first is, is we use some kind of geometric method. So here we're showing uh, parallax. And that will uh, use geometry to calibrate the luminosity of Cepheids. And then you say, OK, now that I know the luminosity of Cepheids, let me find Cepheids in galaxies that host type 1a supernovae. And you say, since I know the luminosity of Cepheids, this then tells me the luminosity of type 1a supernovae. And then you say, OK, now let me go out further where I can measure the, the, the universe's expansion. And you say, OK, well, the, uh, the Hubble constant is degenerate with the luminosity of type 1a supernovae. But since you've already calibrated the luminosity of type 1a supernovae, you can then measure the Hubble constant. So that's the three-step process of, of how, we, how we do this. In kind of more figure form, uh, this, is, this is it. This is the kind of three steps. So first step, we have multiple anchors to calibrate Cepheids. And then we have 19 galaxies that we have uh, uh, Cepheids and type 1a supernovae. And then uh, in the final step, we look out to kind of our big Hubble flow sample where we have hundreds of supernovae, and you can measure the Hubble constant. And ultimately, what we find is that H naught is a bit above 73. Planck is a bit below 67, and this is the the Hubble constant tension. The question is, what's, what's going on? And uh, when we do this, we really, you know, a, a lot of the work is trying to mitigate systematics. So the same instrument is used to measure Cepheids in the first two steps. So we do all the same standardization techniques for supernovae in the second uh, two steps. And kind of as long as you do things the same in kind of the second, third, or the first, or the second, you, you're a lot less sensitive to systematics. And that's kind of the, the beauty of the distance ladder is, is systematic mitigation. All right, so I want to talk about three problems that kind of continually get brought up uh, about the supernova side. So for the shoes team, I do the, the supernova side, so that's, that's, what, that's what I'll talk about. Uh, the first is that because we're statistics limited on the number of galaxies that host uh, a type 1a supernovae that are very nearby, that we can also measure Cepheids, then you have to basically accrue a number of samples uh, to, to make this measurement. And you say, okay, well, some of these samples will date back to the 90s, yeah, how good could this be? Uh, so I spent a lot of time cross-calibrating all these different supernova samples. And kind of the top of this, this is the relative difference in h naught based on if you just kind of measure h naught from, from one of the supernova samples. And the, the black bar is uh, what we used in the last analysis. And uh, some of us tried making a new low redshift sample to, to, to kind of do things differently. And that seems to be, that's called the foundation survey that uses pan stars. Seems to be a very good agreement. But uh, so the, the H naught tension with Planck is on the order of 9%. So you can see that's well off uh, this, this graph. So kind of everything is, is pretty well centered around the mean. Uh, the CMB value is 9% away, and we have a roughly 0.4% or less uh, uncertainty uh, in the mean. All right. So the other thing that's, that's gotten a lot of attention is, well, maybe the supernovae that are in uh, this rung of your distance ladder in the galaxies that host Cepheids are different than the supernovae that are in your Hubble flow. And this is something that Cora is asking about at the end of last talk. Uh, and kind of the reason that this is motivated is that after we do all our standardization, we see some small correlation between supernova, uh, their Hubble residuals, their distance modulus, uh, and the, the properties of their host galaxies. So if we are choosing galaxies that host Cepheids, these are star-forming galaxies. And in this step, we're taking all galaxies. So that could be a bias. If there's something connected to uh, host galaxy, uh, some host galaxy property, and we're doing something different in this step and this step, then we're susceptible to bias. And that's, that's totally reasonable. Um, OK, so, so we can look at that. And basically, 
when we did our last analysis, we, we used a kind of conventional correction. We said, all right, this, this, uh, these residuals correlate with the mass of the host galaxy, but really, we don't know what's driving this correlation. Uh, so we could, we could do different things. So uh, there's, there's been some papers that say, well, the real thing that is, it, that is driving, that is this kind of extra correction factor for the luminosity of supernovae is the, the local star formation right at the position of the supernova. So kind of you could see these small apertures and say, and uh, there, there's been papers that say, this seems to correlate the best. And uh, instead of doing some, some global host mass correction, you should correct for how, um, the, basically the local color right where the supernova is. Uh, this is this paper by Regalt, who's kind of written consecutive papers. So we could say, all right, let's, let's go for it. Let's do this. This is, this is the thing. So we could say, all right, let's do kind of things that he and others would propose, whether we'd have some local mass or some local color of the galaxy. And here we're saying the, the significance of the step. So there's kind of one that we found that is significant. Um, and then really what matters is that how different are your demographics of the galaxies in this middle rung versus the third rung? So if, if they have the same demographics, then if there is some systematic, you're, you're insensitive to it. But if you have, uh, these galaxies are all star, star forming and all these galaxies aren't, then you're very sensitive to it. So that, that demographic breakdown matters a lot. So this is percent in Cepheid calibrators versus percent in Hubble flow. So you say, okay, let's measure the significance of the step, then we could, then we could translate this to a bias in H naught. And basically the biggest bias that we could find is uh, about minus 0.35. So if the difference, if this H naught tension is roughly from 67 to 73 plus, this is 0.35. So kind of taking this as is saying, all right, let's just treat this totally seriously. Let's look, look for every step that we could find this, this is the biggest bias we have. It just, it can't, it can't explain this Hubble constant tension. It's, it's quite small. Okay, now there's, there's a kind of another way about this, which is as we have these bigger and uh, kind of better supernova samples is something that Arturo here works on. We could use, we could use near infrared measurements. And if there's anything, if this galaxy correlation is somehow uh, connected to dust properties in some way, because everything's dust, uh, this is, th this basically, is a way to use supernova measurements in the near infrared so you're not sensitive to it. And they, could, uh, they can measure the Hubble constant just with near infrared light curves. And when they do that, they get 72.8. So we get 73, they get 72.8. So we use the optical, this paper used near infrared, and ultimately it, you get something very different. And any kind of dependence on host properties or something that we, we don't really understand that you kind of see above, it, nothing is significant. So uh, this kind of good support that, that uh, any difference that could be due to supernova with regard to host properties is, is really small. All right, now the third thing that we keep hearing about is, well, maybe we just live in some giant void and that explains everything. Well, uh, so, so there have been papers that, that look at galaxy distributions local to us and some papers say that there are some, some voids and basically what we can do is okay, you say, okay, Let's, let's look at supernova data where we, where we go from Z of roughly zero to Z of 0.5. And we just look for some kink in the Hubble diagram. Uh, basically, uh, a, a sub B is, is, is a proxy for kind of relative to your best fit, um, the intercept here. This is the, the change in, in H naught here. And predictions of different voids are roughly like the, the blue dashed line. And the black is from my, my latest supernova set called Pantheon. And you can see that there's just, there's, there's no kink that we could see. Uh, and, it, and even if there's maybe some little something, uh, Planck is all the way down here. So you know, maybe you could convince yourself, I don't know, something, a little something's going on, but nothing to, tell, nothing to get you anywhere close to Planck. Right? That's, that's just too far. And as far as we could tell, you know, the supernovae are, are showing that there's, there's really absolute, absolutely no, no void that we could see. All right, now you say, well, what, what, what could be going on here? Well, there's kind of two issues. One is with supernovae, they, they have been discovered by certain surveys, oh, uh, and th they're kind of not well, totally perfectly dispersed across the sky, but also these kind of measurements of voids have not been perfectly uh, 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 measured across the sky. Those are in red. So from n-body simulations, you can predict the variance in h naught, uh, and that's about 0.5%, and that's what we see. So as far as we could tell, everything is, is consistent with lack of a void. 
All right. Um, now, kind of one, one final point about supernovae is that you can say, all right, well, there's, there's also BAO, and you could do a reverse distance ladder and use the same supernova sample that we use for shoes, but instead of connecting supernovae to Cepheids, you can connect supernovae to BAO. And when you do that, you get something very close to the Planck value. So, some, so supernovae are kind of this middleman, and if you use them with Cepheids, they give you a, a high value of H0 with an orange, and if you use them with BAO, they give you a low value of the Hubble constant. So if you're kind of pointing at supernovae to be the problem in this, which it takes two of the three rungs of the distance ladder, it seems odd that they're totally happy to go with BAO to give you a low H9. You'd expect some other change happening. All right, so I just kind of, uh, you know, it, uh, one, more, one more thing, which is that the, the, the tension with Planck is 0.2 mag. That's roughly the same size as the, the uh, magnitude of the effect for discovering the accelerating universe. Now, this is the Hubble diagram, kind of the bins are in yellow for my last analysis. And somehow, basically, we need to be off from the black to the green to explain Planck. It just, all, all the kind of little funnies that we see are on this one-ish percent level. There's just nothing going on at the 0.2 mag level. Uh, so I'll leave it there as more slides, but I'm happy to take questions. Thanks. The, the most uh, worrisome issue in my mind yeah. is not uh, observational, it's actually the fact that, you know, when theorists try to explain it, all, all the explanations look a little ad hoc or, or uh, should I say, unnatural or uh, just invented for the purpose of explaining this thing in, in, a, you know, in a very forced way. They don't seem to be very sort of elegant. Right, I, and, I agree. I think that's the, that's the biggest obstacle. situations where, you know, nature might be ugly, but, uh, but usually it's not, you know. Yeah, I, I don't. I agree. I don't know what to say. I mean, there've been recent papers about early dark energy or dark matter radiation that seem to do it, but yeah, it doesn't fall into the prettiness of nature. Uh, then. I, I agree. So, um, what, what's your gut feeling then? <laughs> I, so I think my gut used to be that maybe we're just going to meet in the middle and. I, I, it's, that's just getting harder, uh, and I could like see what's, where things are trending, and it's not trending towards the middle. Um, so I don't know. I wish this would be so much nicer if there's some some nice solution, but it, it, that's not that's not the trend line for right now. Maybe we haven't figured it out yet. Yeah, maybe yeah, that's a challenge for the yeah. active group. Yeah. 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 yeah, Ramesh, and then uh, yeah. so the first run of the distance ladder, the Cepheid, right? Right. You're getting parallax distances. Yeah. But all of those are separated in our galaxy. Yes. So could it be? I mean, that's a sample of one. Mm -hmm. Could it be that our galaxy is just peculiar? So that's and every what, other right. galaxy in which you've seen a Cepheid is different in some way, ten yes. percent different somehow. Right. So, yeah. So that would be a problem. So that that we are relying on Milky Way parallaxes, but that's one of four anchors. So we also have three other galaxies that uh, are not our galaxy. And so that's, so you know, here's Milky Way, but then we have LMC, M31, and NGC 4258. And they're, they're all consistent. Uh, so if, if we just, if we're just relying on the Milky Way, then yeah, I totally agree. But now, yeah, we have four. And even the Milky Way, there's, there's three different ways we do this measurement it's consistent. But if we just had the Milky Way, I totally, I totally agree with you, but having all the other anchors, yeah. yeah. Um, right. Other comments, questions? Um, how about um, so does the fact that when you connect it to BAO, give you the Planck value, that, does that tell us that the tension really is between the redshift of the BAO and today as opposed to earlier? Yeah, so yeah, with, with the BAO measurement, you are using sound horizon information. So there have been papers recently that, that try to say it's not H dot tension, it's sound horizon tension. But it's, it's unclear kind of where, I think if the tension somewhere all the way now-ish or very early, but I, uh, <laughs> the, the thing is that with, with supernovae and BAO, we kind of, the middle land looks very close to Lambda CDM. So I think it seems like the kind of the excitement is pushing, yeah, to, to, to the poles. Because the, the, the reason, uh, I mean, the Hubble constant evolution could affect also the growth of structure and other things. So yeah. we can, in principle, look at it with other probes. That's right, right. So yeah, there's this, yeah, uh, S8, kind of tension that people are starting to get excited about, and maybe this is connected, but I don't think that's at the level of the Hubble constant tension. Was there another question? Yeah. 
Sorry, Barry. Um, you, sh you showed the effect of <coughs> going into the near infrared. Yeah. Uh, and admittedly, it didn't move you substantially toward the pump value. Right. But are there plans to follow it up farther into the infrared with JWSD, such that if dust is not the issue, right. it should plateau out? Yeah. Uh, if dust, in fact, is being underestimated in its effect by more than we think, then you might think observing it four, even eight microns would show that. Right. So, yeah. So, for, uh, right, that's, that's, a, that's a great point. So, for JWST, basically, it, it will allow you to be less dust sensitive, but it won't be good for cepheids. So cepheids are just bright in the optical. So actually things are worse for, uh, with JWST than for HST. But there are other, so, but you can replace cepheids and do a like tip of the red giant branch. And that will then basically give you uh, uh, less dust sensitivity and push you out further. But for kind of the, this game that I'm talking about in terms of Cepheids, you, you're not gaining with JWST. Um, and yeah, for, for the supernova side, you, I think JWST is just too expensive. To, you could do these near infrared measurements from the ground. Uh, so there's a place for JWST, but I think that at least for shoes, we won't get to play with it. Makes sense. Why don't we look forward to seeing what comes out in the coming years, and uh, hopefully we we'll discover new physics. I Let's thank too. Dan again. Yeah, thank you. All right, so um, I'm going to give you a talk that I think could equally well be at home uh, for a, a, a group of condensed matter physicists as well as uh, particle physicists. I'm going to tell you about um, critical gravitational collapse and, and how you can observe it in, in many body systems. So uh, hopefully I won't give you too much whiplash here, intellectual whiplash. So uh, ultimately I'm going to be interested in, in two different, two seemingly different types of processes. One will be uh, thermalization in, in a mini body system. A nice example of that um, is uh, heavy ion collisions at the LHC or at, or at the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider where you collide two large nuclei like gold or lead, you produce a far from equilibrium state, and then, and then remarkably you produce uh, shortly after the collision a uh, system, a quark gluon plasma, which behaves as a, as a nearly per perfect liquid. It's the most ideal fluid that's ever been observed in nature. Obviously, if, if there's a, a suitably large impact parameter, there's no collision, and so you won't have any, any liquid, and so it stands to reason that there should be some critical impact parameter uh, uh, inside of which this collision should be able to produce a system that, that, that it equilibrates. So, of course, the other system I'm going to tell you about is critical gravitational collapse, which Matt Chaptuik discovered about 30 years ago in the 90s, uh, in a completely different context from this, of course. Um, what Chaptuik discovered is that gravitational systems that are on the threshold of collapse, meaning there's some parameter epsilon, if epsilon is greater than epsilon star, uh, they produce a black hole. What Chaptuik discovered is that very close to epsilon star, uh, the geometry exhibits some universal features. So in particular, he discovered something that he called scale echoing, where um, if you rescale time and space, the, 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 the solution looks exactly the same. So in other words, uh, the gravitational solution echoes down to smaller and smaller scales where it either forms a black hole or exactly at criticality it forms a, a naked singularity. Moreover, he discovered that the, that the mass of the produced black hole has this, this scaling right here near criticality with some exponent gamma, which is universal. It doesn't depend on, on initial conditions, on, on how you... Uh, created the, the black hole. So these are the, the, the two different phenomena that I want to discuss today, uh, and, and they're, they're, they turn out to be intimately related, and they're related by what's called holographic duality, which is something that was discovered here at Harvard about 20 years ago in, in the physics department, and, and, and sort of uh, 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 saying it in the simplest possible term, in the simplest possible way, so you can fit it in a 10-minute in a talk, uh, holography says that a black hole in a box you should think about as being 
equivalent to a mini body system, some quantum mini body system that lives on the boundary of the box. So if I have some, some box here, this sphere, and I put a black hole in, in it, holography tells me that on the boundary of this box, you, there should be some strongly coupled uh, mini body system that lives there. So strongly coupled just means, you know, mean free path as small as quantum mechanics will allow. And, and if you accept this is true, and there's been thousands and thousands of papers uh, demonstrating this, uh, uh, suggesting this is true, um, the, the Chopturk's observation of critical gravitational collapse suggests that there should exist what you might want to call crit critical equilibration or critical thermalization in many body systems. And so that's what I want to explore today. And I want to give you just a little bit more insight into how this works. I'm not going to go into great details, but I want you to, I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to compute the evolution of a stress tensor in a, in a mini body system. And I want you to understand at least a little bit how you can get that from gravity. So forget gravity for the moment and think about electrodynamics. Suppose I took a charge, uh, uh, sorry, a, a conducting sphere, a hollow sphere, and I put a charge in it. The electric field of that charge would end on the sphere and it would induce some, some charge density on the surface of the sphere. That's just classical electrodynamics. And it turns out that something almost identical happens in gravity and just classical general relativity. <coughs> If I have uh, gravity, if I study gravity in a box and I have some object in there, say a black hole or gravitational waves, uh, Einstein's equations imply there's some induced stress tensor on the surface of, of our box. And that's just all classical general relativity. Where holography enters into it here is more or less just in terms of the interpretation. It tells you sh you should interpret this stress tensor classical general relativity predicts as an expectation value of an operator in some, in some quantum theory. And so at the end of the day, uh, this, is, this is what I'm going to show you here for critical gravitational collapse. So the basic setup here uh, is as follows. Uh, you, you always have the freedom to make your life as miserable as possible in these uh, numerical relativity calculations. And so it's, it's best to spend much more time thinking about how you're going to solve the problem than actually solving it. Um, so, uh, which is what we did here. We studied five-dimensional gravity in, a, in anti de Sitter space, which is a maximally symmetric solution to Einstein's equations with, an, with, a, with a negative cosmological constant. And then uh, what makes this problem doable is you, you assume some sort of symmetry, in particular SO3 times U1 symmetry which makes the geometry homogeneous in angles, but, but, but anisotropic. So in other words, the numerical relativity problem becomes one plus one dimensional. So here's a, a sort of a cartoon of anti de Sitter space with time running up. Uh, each slice of constant time is, 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 is topologically speaking a four dimensional sphere with a boundary which is a three dimensional sphere. And it's, where the, it's, it's on this boundary where you should think of the dual quantum system as, as living. Uh, the dual quantum system on this, on the, on this boundary, on this three-dimensional sphere, will inherit this symmetry here. It'll be homogeneous but anisotropic, which means that at every point on the sphere, you'll observe the same stress energy tensor, the same energy density, but there'll be different pressures in two different directions. So you'll have a system which is, which is out of equilibrium. And so it turns out, if you work through just energy momentum conservation, that the only dynamical degree of freedom uh, in this setup is just the pressure anisotropy, the difference of the pressures, which is what I'll, I'll show you on the, on the next slide. So ultimately, at the end of the day, you put in some initial data here in your gravitational description on some, some t equals constant slice. You evolve forward in time, you tune towards criticality, and then the near boundary behavior of your gravitational field will determine the evolution of the stress tensor. And so you can go ahead and do these numerical simulations. And in the gravity description, here's, here's a just some metric coefficient as a function of the logarithm of the radial coordinate. You see these nice sinusoidal oscillations in log r. Uh, this is very close to criticality. It turns out there's an event horizon right here. And so you, you see this, the, the presence of what I, this scale echoing that I, that I referred to earlier. This, the system is, aside from, a, from, from a, uh, some envelope function, it's periodic in, in log r. 
And so this, this, this wave train that you see here will propagate out to the, to the boundary of this space-time, to the surface of the box, if you will, and it will determine the evolution of the boundary stress tensor. Again, think about ele that electromagnetic analog. And so this is what you observe for the pressure anisotropy as a function of time. And I plotted this not as a function of linear time, but as a function of some log time, log t minus t star, and I'll, I'll tell you what t star is in a second. And so uh, there are a bunch of different curves here, and each curve has, has, is dialed more, more closely to epsilon star, the critical point, and, and that is the, 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 uh, uh, the, the, the black curve is the closest. What you see happens is that there's some set of oscillations that develop. They're more or less uniformly spaced in this log time, which means that you see that the presence of scale echoing in your quantum <coughs> mini body system. There are more oscillations present as, as you approach criticality. And in fact, if, if you had uh, uh, the motivation and the time, you should see infinitely many oscillations as epsilon goes to epsilon star as you approach criticality. This time shift that I had right here, this T star, turns out to just be the time where, for the, for the critical solution, where you, you produce a naked singularity. It's the, the time in which that naked singularity makes causal contact with the boundary of anti de Sitter space. So uh, in, in, in this log plot here, that time will be infinitely far to the right. And so if you imagine you actually tune to criticality, you'll see you know, just infinitely many oscillations appearing here, all uniformly separated in, in this time variable here. So uh, I told you that, that, that critical uh, gravitational collapse, there, there, there's also scalings present. In particular, the mass of the produced black hole uh, ha has a scaling as you approach criticality. You can also see those scalings in uh, these many body systems. First of all, as you tune towards criticality, as I said earlier, you see more and more oscillations here present in time. Uh, if you now take this signal right here and you do a, a, sh a short time Fourier transform, not in log time, but in linear time, um, and look at the maximum frequency oscillation, lo and behold, you, you obtain this scaling right here, that the maximum frequency scales like the distance to criticality to this critical exponent gamma over two. The, the, the last thing that I will mention here before I conclude uh, is that you can also see the, the signatures of naked singularities in the stress tensor. As you approach criticality, this maximum frequency, of course, goes to infinity. But moreover, the pressure anisotropy for the critical solution diverges in time, like one over t minus t star. So you can see scale echoing, you can see the, 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 the scalings of critical phenomena, and you can also see the presence of naked singularities all in, 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 in uh, many body systems. So I'm gonna conclude here. Let me offer you just some quick concluding remarks. Uh, first of all, uh, classical black holes have universal character. They don't depend on what they're made out of. They don't, de they don't depend on they only, they only care about mass, charge, and angular momentum, conserve quantities. And, and in holography, what that means is that strongly coupled systems have a, have a universal character. It doesn't matter which, which theory you're studying, if it's a theory of superfluids or if it's a theory of quark-gluon plasma, they have universal features. And critical collapse is also a universal phenomenon too. Uh, aside from the, the numerical values of these exponents, of, of, of the exponent, the basic phenomena is universal. And so I, I think a reasonable conclusion here is that this cr critical equilibration that I've told you about is a generic property of, of, of certainly of holographic many body systems, but it's probably also a generic property of strongly coupled many, many body systems as a whole. And with that said, I'm going to go ahead and stop it right here. Thank you. Paul, this is a beautiful mathematical analogy between the two systems, um, but would you, um, I mean, is it fair to say that um, it's easier to, to do the calculation in one frame and therefore apply it to the other frame, uh, and which frame is it easier to do? Right, so, so the question is basically, could I have just learned all of this just being a field theorist? Right. And the answer is no, uh, for a couple reasons. So first of all, I do not believe this phenomena exists at we in, for, in weakly coupled field theories. I believe it's only a strongly coupled phenomena. And that, that's another question we can come to in a moment. Once you accept that as being true, you, know, you, gotta, you have to ask, how do I compute anything in a quantum field theory which is strongly coupled? Uh, there are all sorts of examples where people want to do this. There are Nobel Prizes waiting to be won. 
if you could explain high, T, high TC superconductivity, for example. Um, uh, we just have no computational tools available to study any strongly interacting system. So in a sense, uh, that is why this phenomena is surprising. All of our experiences with weakly coupled theories with kinetic theory, and you just never observe this with kinetic theory. In other words, you, you can derive new results now that they were not, I mean, here you derive something that is pretty much recognized, but in principle you can derive new results in strongly coupled systems that were not known before. Absolutely. Yeah. So, in the analogy where uh, rho in ENM would be in inducing some electric field on a surface with uh, some divergence that could be detected right outside the surface, would T mu nu uh, uh, that's induced on the outside have some sort of signature that's not just on like the n minus one dimensional surface, but that could also leak out maybe some sort of per perturbation of the the metric. There, there's, there, there's, there's no leaking out because the geometry just ends here. Uh, it's just the, the end of the geometry. So that analogy wouldn't work if, uh, I mean, it, it, you would have an electric field that, that you would see in the space outside of Yeah, yeah, right, right. But, yeah. but so that analogy yeah, is just yeah. not. Yeah, I, I think if I gave this talk to, his, to the string theorists, they would, they, would, uh, they would be very upset. With <laughs> 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 but, uh, uh, right, it's just, in this, in this example right here, in, in this case right here, the geometry literally just ends here. It, it's a, when you say black hole in a box, what you really mean is a black hole in a geometry that has a boundary. So it's not really meaningful to speak about what happens outside of the boundary. One more over there or something? Is there a question? No. It sounds like everything was clear. And <laughs> <laughs> you always say that when I give a talk, Avi. I'm not saying anything so clear. It's, it's, it's a fact. I mean every word. <laughs> I wanted to wish everyone a very productive uh, spring break and see you in a couple of weeks.